thank you um, for joining us. Um, and thank you for um, Open Ethics and um, the Open Ethics series. So we are um, going to talk about some amazing things. We've got amazing speakers today. Um, so just a quick housekeeping. We have an agenda. We're going to go through some fast, um, short talks and have a short discussion with the, the panel about those talks um, with our amazing panelists. Uh, we are then going to open it up and have some discussions um, from you. So if you could go to Slido, there's the address on the um, slides there. So Slido, and then it's 12521, and ask us questions. Um, so as you're listening to the presentations, think about the questions you can ask, and then we'll get to those near the end. Um, we'll start with a brief introduction to everyone. We'll just go around the panel. And we've actually got one of the panelists who is going to drop in later, so we'll do their um, introduction then when they can join us. Um, so we would like you, if possible, if you have Twitter or LinkedIn and we have a hashtag Open Ethics Series, um, please use that uh, to promote and continue this discussion. We've also got a Discord server that we can um, discuss more about all these different subjects uh, later on. And you can see that we've actually already produced a um, event on artificial intelligence and accountability. And today we're talking about uh, human in the loop, AI, governance, agency, and oversight. Um, all these amazing terms that we're going to get to grips with today. I someone else is uh, used to be muted. Sorry, guys. Do we, should we do the introductions then? Uh, Nikita, do you want to start with yourself? Uh, yeah, sure. So. Uh... Thanks a lot. First of all, thanks a lot for 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 joining the call. It's a it's a great pleasure for me to host the amazing speaker and having Ben agree to moderate this talk. Ben has an amazing experience in uh, besides uh, software development and design. Uh, he is a big ambassador for ethics, and he he's very much into the field. So it was pleasure for him agreeing to. Uh, uh, to bring himself to the meeting. So on my side, I'm a physicist by education, and uh, right now I'm working on two two projects, one of which is a virtual coach. Uh, we use natural language processing uh, and machine learning to ask questions based on the user's stories to coach them. And uh, Open Ethics is the second project I'm working on. It's a nonprofit initiative that is meant to bring transparency standards to AI self-disclosure, and we do this um, through standardizing the way developers, uh, product owners, and software engineers can talk about their systems and practices that they that they implemented. And this is this is an open source initiative, so anyone is very very welcome to join. Where the open ethics is basically an educational part of it, where we want to make sure that everyone understands and gets some practical hints on what actually to do in uh, the complex regulatory landscape that is emerging. Ansgar, maybe I, I pass the, the mic to you. OK, sure, thank you. And uh, thank you very much for the invitation to be on this panel. Uh, it's uh, it's great to engage uh, with such a, um, an active group of people. So uh, my background is actually on the intersection between neuroscience, psychology and robotics. For a long time I did research on that uh, sort of doing biologically inspired robotics or using computational modeling to try to understand how the, the brain structures control, do sensory motor control. Uh, however, in around 2014 I started looking more at computational social science and specifically the ethics questions around using online data for trying to understand and model human behavior. And for instance, the fact that um, university ethics review boards are very inconsistent in which in the way in which they would assess those kinds of research projects, depending on which department you are in. A psychology department ethics review board will assess it very differently from a computer science or business school ethics review board. Um, that work led to actually looking not just at the collection of data and the way in which researchers might be using it, but also the way in which recommender systems and search engines shape the way in which we experience the online world. Um, and 
how do uh, users of these platforms actually understand and engage with them? And really, we did a research project around how 13 to 16 year olds understand these and what their, con their concerns are. That research project led to becoming engaged with the IEEE on their global initiative on ethics of autonomous intelligence systems, which was starting at the end of 2016, beginning 2017. And so I'm chairing one of their standards development working groups, which is look, developing standard for algorithmic bias considerations to basically provide a from a technical community uh, with input from the civil society at um, academic and industry to provide a guide for uh, a process to follow when developing or deploying these kinds of systems. Um, that work led to getting in touch with um, people at EY, Ernst & Young, uh, and really getting the invitation to join them as a global AI ethics and regulatory leader, which basically means that within EY, I help with the uh, governance structure that we are creating and using around the use of AI systems, uh, but also the way in which EY does consulting for uh, various companies around uh, the ethical considerations and, and the regulatory considerations that need to be considered when introducing AI into the processes, as well as engaging with the public policy team uh, where in communicating with the European Union or, or other um, national or regional bodies, such as uh, the OECD Network of Experts on AI, for instance, um, around trying to really help with how to craft the best way of uh, regulating or providing oversight or other trust mechanisms for how to use these kinds of technologies. Okay, so who should we hand over to next? Uh, I guess Kourosh. Uh, first of all, hello everyone. I'm glad that I can present uh, some of my work today for you. Uh, actually, I am a researcher and PhD student at University of Hull. Currently, I'm working on two projects. One is DREAM, that we are going to develop a data-driven reliability center. Uh, evolutionary uh, maintenance planning for offshore wind farms. And the other project is SafeML that I'm going to briefly present today. That is about uh, the safety monitoring of machine learning classifiers using statistical distance measures. And we have the specific procedure for using human in the loop uh, to make sure that the safety of the machine learning is satisfied. That's it. Awesome. So I'm aware that I, I probably like was waving my hands around and no one could hear me. So that's kind of embarrassing. So I apologize for that. Um, so if you missed it, um, please do get involved and um, hashtag um, open ethics series. Um, I'm Ben Bikert and um, I'm from Ethical by Design. Um, we consult on the kind of the AI ethics questions around deploying um, machine learning uh, systems so uh, that you can deploy more responsible, more trustworthy systems and consider all the issues and impacts uh, as you're doing that. Uh, so very much in, in the um, ballpark with these guys and it's, uh, it's going to be a fascinating a couple of talks. Um, so without further ado, um, who um, would we like to have first? And Nikita? Yeah, I can I can go first. Um, so let me let me jump into uh, into our presentation quickly. Yeah. Yeah. Great. And again, if you'd like to ask questions, go to Slido and it's one two five two one. And Idoya is just joining so I when she will get into uh, I want to invite her directly to to present herself b before before we start. Idoya can you hear us? Yes thank you very much I, I was having trouble getting into the into the call so I'm so happy I finally made it. 
Okay. Thank you, Dai. Would you mind, would you, we just finished the round of introduction before you. We, we thought you were going to join as you promised us. Nine, we're uh, okay at it. 30, but please join well, us in, in right, introducing exactly. yourself. So what needs to change? So once we built that strong data foundation and had confidence <laughs> in data terms, what it gives you is the ability, right, to reason over a confident set of data. Yeah, I think there was someone in the call as well. Uh, Idoya, could you please? Okay. Uh, okay. Welcome. Uh, okay, um, just introduce myself then. Okay, uh, my name is Idoya Salazar. I'm president of the Observatory for the Ethics, uh, Ethical and, and Social Impact of Artificial Intelligence here in Madrid, Spain. Um, I'm also working in the University, San Pablo Theo University in Madrid, Spain, and um, I'm leading a group uh, of, of a research group which is called SIMPER, Social Impact of Artificial Intelligence, <laughs> also, and robotics, and robotics. And I have been, I am a journalist. I have been working in, in some communication groups for, um, uh, for uh, about uh, 15 years, but always dedicated to the part of technology in the part of the websites and, or, and also leading um, um, innovation projects of semantic of semantic technologies in implementing te semantic technologies in in some of the in the media I was in, and um, and nowadays as I told you I'm, I'm I'm working at the university and leading this project this observatory, and what is one of the main things about our observatory is that we try to to land all the theory about the ethics of artificial intelligence. We try to not theorize that much, but try to get into practice all of these, all of these theories and all of these uh, code of ethics. Try to um, land all these things into different companies and organizations that are, that are nowadays using these artificial intelligence systems. And I think more or less that's all. Awesome. I, can, I could say to you must more things, but I think that's enough. I will also want to listen to you. <laughs> cool. So, uh, Nikita, have you found your slides? Yeah. So let me uh, let me start the screen sharing. Let me know if you can it's see working. the screen well. I'm going to. Swap the screen. Should be visible right now. Mm -hmm. Yep. So as uh, as I said, uh, I'm Nikita Lukianets, founder of the Open Ethics Initiative. Today, I want to specifically focus the attention on on the human in the loop and different configurations for human in the loop. Um, I want to make sure that we do have a common ground understanding of how learning system and decision models work. And to do that, I want to dissect uh, it into several levels of, um, of making decision or, or, ac or actions, starting from perception, decision, making an action and evaluating of how, how success successful this action uh, is. And we obviously want to do better in, uh, in every of those uh, of those elements and if you see on the bottom there's a little girl that is jumping like a horse or trained jumping like a horse I very much like this image because uh, for me it talks about the environment and how uh, how the environment is actually impacting the behavior of, of our and uh, for for human on the loop what we what we want to emphasize on is that human on the loop systems, are necessary not only for safety but also to improvement of what of, of what we um, of what we want the system uh, the system to do. So it's not only a control but but a learning thing. And what we also know is that in majority of the modern machine learning uh, machine learning powered systems, they they do depend on a large amount of data. It's either an annotated data or data that is collected from existing historical decisions that is then annotated. But nevertheless, controlling the quality 
uh, of this requires a huge amount of work. So what can we do and how can we benefit from continuous monitoring and, and uh, of these systems? And wh why exactly do we want to, to have a human in the loop? So one of the elements is the making machines model, models accurate, as we know, uh, going to the accuracy fa faster, making humans more accurate, accurate in, in, in having a machine aided decision making or uh, making humans more efficient, meaning making good decisions faster. And in the categorization of different types of human in the loop systems, we can uh, frequently see, we, we, can, we can look at two different dimensions, at the learning dimension and control dimensions. In the learning dimension, uh, we talk about how do we involve uh, how do we involve humans in raising confidence over uh, over their training data? And human in the loop is regarded as a combination of supervised machine learning where the, the set of the training data uh, is initially labeled by human and then the active learning. And this piece, uh, the, this active learning piece is where we use statistical methods to actually understand how we can make machine improve faster uh, instead of just continuing to monotonously uh, labeling uh, element wise uh, data point by data point by data point we want to label only those data points that have a high impact on uh, on our on our model's output so this is this is one domain and another domain is that we actually can work on controlling the system's output and make uh, and creating the feedback loop to, to improve the system. And today I want to specifically focus on this control uh, control aspect of human in the loop and tell you briefly or underline those those things that that probably some of you uh, already know is why do we why do we need human in the loop and why it's it is one of the requirements of uh, the white paper of the high level expert group, for example, or uh, NIST uh, candidate for standards in artificial intelligence is because uh, right now we are not sure in how accurate the outputs are and how these outputs can impact the, the life of individuals, given we are combining uh, complex systems uh, together. So we want to put human as uh, as an element uh, of control that would be basically aided by the machine. So machine is not, uh, in from, from this uh, perspective, machine is not making any decision, but rather aiding a human, um, human or a human team in making these decisions. So in, if we want to bring this, uh, bring an effective design to, to human controlled systems, we can do it in, in several ways. So we can put several configurations and these configurations are either a swarm configuration when there are multiple machines uh, making decisions and confirming each other and that there, that there is a human. When there is a console where multiple humans are controlling the out of, of one machine, a crowdsourcing element where, where we involve uh, the user in providing a feedback control to, in a feedback loop, loop to the output of the system, and we, when we do have one single expert who is supervising, uh, who is supervising machine output, and is actually the one who delivers the output to, uh, to the to the end users. And in this, uh, by by having those configurations, we we typically want to achieve the following uh, outcomes as humans would either confirm decision of machine, would advise the machine, or we would rather have machine to confirm the human decision or machine to advise uh, based on based on the human decision. So these are all valid configurations and there there could be intermingled with this um, with this decision objective or, or output of objective for the machines. So this is a basic basic theory, but to complete uh, to complete this theory with uh, with useful takeaway actions for uh, for those product owners and developers who are at our company. I want to talk about 
several takeaways uh, that are coming from um, from research. The first one, uh, I wanted to talk about uh, mitigation uh, mitigation of human annotation errors. So there was an experiment uh, run by uh, run by researchers where they have suggested to a human labelers or human validators uh, a different sequences of uh, validation. And what they have found out is that the ability of a human expert to learn to successfully validate uh, or on the contrary, object machine decision very much depends on the sequence at which we present these decisions and at which the human uh, the human uh, in the loop is learning. So it's very important as we as we involve humans in decisions and sometimes we don't have confidence on their uh, on their expertise. It's very important to carefully craft uh, carefully craft the 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 instances for validation so the humans can learn. So this is one number one. Number two is about going beyond the validation of output. Uh, what is shown there is that providing not only the final decisions uh, or not only the final outputs of machines, but also in intermediary uh, intermediary elements. Uh, for example, in in this research paper, they show that they were providing to uh, human validators the structure of sentences in, in in the form of predicates that was useful for for humans to object decisions and it was shown through through a b testing that uh, th there was a higher quality achieved with this supplementary information the third element is uh, is important uh, in designing cyber physical systems and human in the loop in because because the way humans are making their decisions are very much supplied or directed by human bias. And therefore, uh, having, in addition to a human validation uh, where, where it involves a mental activity, uh, it's very important also to include the additional information that will uh, that will validate those decisions with with the biological integration. For example, to look at the level of uh, the level of stress, the the uh, the validation is taking to look on skin conductance response, or to look at how uh, the pressure or, or the local temperatures is changing. So this is uh, this is a, an interesting element to uh, an important element to consider to be able to. Uh, get rid of a part, uh, get rid of part of human bias uh, on the on the validation scheme. And the fourth element uh, I want you to to think of is uh, redundancy as as a very important element of safety. So some some people tend to think that human in the loop is an element of the system that is um, an option. Uh, there is a research uh, a research framework that is advocating for uh, for redundancy, specifically in uh, in criticals in in mission critical systems. So it's not only necessary to include it, but to have the redundant uh, component of human validation. And uh, I I want to finish here by by giving you the the idea of what we are. Uh, what we're bringing in Open Ethics Transparency Protocol, we're bringing the way for uh, for product owners and product developers to disclose their information and methods on the hu human and the loop side in machine readable way, so that it could be controlled by multiple multiple ad agents, both machines, and then translated into something very visual for uh, for humans who who uh, who interact with uh, the we interact with machine learning powered systems or automated autonomous systems. Uh, so that's that's it. Uh, please make sure that human in the loop setup uh, and be aware that human in the loop setup is not re removing responsibility, just shifting it from uh, from developers to the one uh, who who is making uh, who is making the validation. But uh, what it does allow it allows a two-way um, two-way communication. So um, I'm 
I'm closing the uh, the sharing right now, and uh, you're very much uh, you're very much welcome to uh, drop your questions in the uh, to to drop your questions in our slider tool. Great. Um, do we have any comments from the other panelists uh, before we move on to our next um, talk? Um, do you have any comments or thoughts that you can just add or specific questions for Nikita? Yeah. Yes, yeah, so um, one thing I'd like to just add to this is uh, human in the loop is definitely an important um, factor for a lot of use cases that it can provide this kind of additional safety. On the other hand, there is also concern if human in the loop is being presented too much as sort of the solution for uh, any kinds of issues with the AI systems. Basically a, well, we don't need to worry about building our system reliably. We will just say that there's a human in the loop in the end who has to approve or not whatever recommendation the system makes. And therefore uh, it's up to the human to cope with any potential problem that might arise. And this is specifically challenged by human psychology, which, for instance, uh, automation bias, which is basically if the system has performed correctly in the last 50, 60, 70 uh, iterations where it was used, you naturally are uh, not capable of you know, really critically assessing the new uh, output, output that is coming. You will more or less automatically say, well, it's worked properly the last so many times, I'm sure this new result is good as well. And uh, your ability to really perform that oversight function uh, is inhibited. So um, what kind of processes or methodologies um, have you been thinking about, Nikita, in, in this context uh, of human in the loop for trying to um, counteract these potential problems that might arise? Uh, there, so first of all, I, I, I very much share the concerns that you're raising and other researchers are raising. Uh, specifically, what, what is discussed is our ability to reason and to avoid shortcuts when we are in in this configuration of we have to make a decision but 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 we are already advised so we're we we try to conserve our energy and not to make any decision because well machine machine has said so and it has a have a limited uh, have limited abilities to 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 make these decisions and there is an opinion uh, that configurations of human in the loop systems should be designed in such a way where actually humans are aided by a machine to make a decisions but there is another loop of control by the machine to control the validation of the human so it's a kind of it's kind of a double double validation where mach where, where machine is looking after a human actually but not the human uh not but not human is looking uh, after a machine but so so it, it is very much linked also to responsibility design so how open to how open we are in making errors in the organizations, how open we are to contradict the machine, and who is going to be blamed when when the decision is not taken in in in, in the right manner. That's my thoughts. I think there's a tricky questions that will definitely probably get come back to at the end of the the, the talks, and then we'll have to have a serious answer to those. Um, I've got a really quick question that came through on the Slido. Um, you presented that it was a, you know, the different types of human in the loop um, process. I was just, we had a question about whether this process is always required um, on, in a general term, you know, do we always need a human in the loop? And if we, you know, mostly do, are we expecting that person, like you kind of pointed out, to be somewhat, um, used or um, kind of knowledgeable, skillful about the system, maybe about data, data science itself, and maybe just about the app kinds of outputs and, you know, what kind of competency are you expecting from those types of people? 
I think this is very much a question of uh, software requirements and also legal requirements. If we look at uh, the, the Article 22 uh, in GDPR, for example, they're talking about the automated decision making and the ability of hu of humans who are influenced by by machine decisions to do the objections of these decisions with the with with the real human. So it's a post decision validation and objection. It's not the in the process human human in the loop, but but this is the objection question. Uh, I very much uh, think that the configuration of how do you put the human in the loop, either in control or in learning or in objection, is up to the area the, the, the area and the subject expertise. And also depending on how confident you are about the quality of decision making by, by the individual. Because you can you can have the the person who is communicating that has has a low level of uh, low, low level of subject matter expertise, but still he has a human, uh, he or she has a human touch. Uh, on the other regard, if we if we're doing a, a decision with medical consequence, we need to have a doctor that has a very high level of, uh, of expertise or a council of doctors. Great. So we've got another a question. Uh, you got your hand up, Karosh. Uh, First of all, um, uh, thanks a lot for your uh, valuable, uh, let's say, presentation. It was very interesting for me. Uh, I have a one uh, challenging question that when we have the short time or restricted time for decision making for a human in the loop uh, procedure, for example, consider when we have a, a driver on the, in the self-driving car and we want to have the driver as the, let's say, human in the loop, then how we can handle this situation that the time for making a decision when the confidence for the car is low to, for example, make this decision very fast and very quick and how we can uh, make a solution for such a kind of systems. Um, I I can come up with this decision right now. I don't know how, how relevant it is. Uh, the latency of the human decision might be around 100, 150, 200 milliseconds in this particular uh, case. And uh, if machine can make a critical decision that has a lower, uh, lower la latency, and if it's required, I guess we should, uh, we should take this into consideration. But I, I'm not working on autonomous vehicles, so I cannot answer uh, with uh, with great confidence to this question. Great, uh, sounds like another one we'll be coming back to as well. Um, so let's move to our next speaker. So um, could I ask if um, Ansgar, you're ready? Um, sure, yeah. Um, I, I will not be using any slides so we can continue this mode. Um, and I thought I'd focus on uh, the, the question around human agency and oversight as sort of key requirements for trustworthy AI. Um, so I'm coming at this from a number of uh, activities that I'm engaged with. One is the IEEE standards development, but the other also in the academic research that we've been doing under the Reintrust project, especially we've been really asking what do users consider to be mechanisms that would give them a sense of I can trust this system or not. And so maybe starting from that process, uh, it's actually quite challenging because different user groups have different kinds of requirements that they need. Uh, so for instance, in the Reintrust project, we've been looking at two different kind of cohorts, the um, 18 to 26 group and the 65 and older group. Uh, and even on something like online platforms and the simple recommender algorithms that you get in, let's say, a hotel booking kind of uh, situation, we find that uh, the different age groups have different ways of evaluating, do I think this is trustworthy? So the, typically the younger age group tend to be looking more at just the, the level of performance 
the, the reliability of the system. You know, is it prov providing something to me? Uh, when I redo the search, do I get the same kind of results and those kinds of questions? Whereas the older age group tends to actually be thinking more along the lines of, do I trust this organization that I'm engaging with? What is the, you know, is this business actually aligned with the kind of values that I have? Uh, and so it's really less about the technological reliability and more around the business models or uh, the larger reputation of the organization that they're engaging with. So trustworthiness or you know, people's sense of whether they want to trust, in, you know, trust an AI system uh, can have quite different dimensions. And in that sense, it can be challenging to say, well, just use this kind of methodology to try and um, build trustworthiness in through the system. However, um, obviously we do need to be working on this. Uh, and so one of the uh, approaches that is being taken that is, is strongly being pursued is the standards development. So um, ISO IEC has been uh, very active. There's uh, the um, uh, SC42, it's the, the numbering of their uh, standards communities, uh, is focusing on developing standards for AI around things like robustness, uh, but also societal impacts of AI is, is one of the things that they've started a working group on recently. Um, and the idea is really to try and develop some uh, core agreed upon methods of, of working. Now, the IEEE also started work on this, like I mentioned in my introduction, and particularly, so I'll, I'll talk a bit about what we're doing in the um, algorithmic bias considerations standards working group, um, because uh, what Nikita was reflecting on, sort of the, the importance of the human in this kind of decision making process is really actually a core of the way in which we end up looking at it as well. The AI system, be it machine learning or uh, decision trees or other kinds of methodologies, it is a tool. It performs a task that it has been built for. Uh, it is optimizing towards a certain kind of um, decision uh, accuracy criteria that was defined for it by humans and effectively these are products of you know built by humans in organizations which is basically a collection of humans operating in a society which is a human thing we humans together have decided as to you know what are the correct kind of values to hold and what are the rules and regulations that we want to be living by so really it it all boils back down to humans having be being accountable and responsible for how these systems operate. And so the, the core principle that we're looking at in something like the algorithm bias consideration standard is really around, are you clear as to what kind of decisions your system is making, what kind of decisions you made when building the system? And do you have justifications for why you chose this measure of fairness as opposed to the other measure of fairness, for instance? How are you communicating these justifications and decisions to the different types of stakeholders that the system is going to be engaging with? So both uh, internally within your own organization, um, but also externally to uh, impacted people, uh, you know, users of the system, and potentially also regulators as regulation is developing more. So it's really a process uh, kind of standard that talks about the identification of who are the internal and external stakeholders that are related to this system that you're building. Um, what are the optimization criteria that you're using? Why are you using these? Why are these appropriate in your particular kind of context? Um, how have you selected your data sets and made the decision as to whether they are sufficiently representative of those stakeholders you've identified? Um, how have you evaluated these kinds of uh, the performance of the system? And why is it that the, this evaluation method that you used is considered to be the appropriate one for this particular application case? And so really all of this comes back down to human decision making in the way in which the system is being produced. Um, and so trustworthiness of an AI system beyond the simple is it reliable as in its performance is repeatable uh, is to a large extent it's a question about the organization behind it 
and the way in which the organization is clear about what they're doing uh, and is communicating about what they are doing. And this is sort of the, the, the baseline framework that we are talking about when designing this particular standard. Um, and this is also something that we are seeing, for instance, around uh, trustworthy AI in the industry kind of context from, from the work with uh, EY, for instance. Uh, why is it that uh, at this moment, less than 10% of the AI projects that are being started in, in the majority of companies are actually being moved out of the experimental sandbox kind of phase in input into production? It's largely because the organizations themselves don't feel confident um, that the system is reliable, that once it is exposed to a um, to the real world context, that they will be able to guarantee its performance. Um, and this is to a large extent also a question of communication again between humans, the communication between the people who are building the system, uh, the uh, board of directors, etc., who have ultimate accountability for how the system and uh, of the organization are operating. Um, and so this is one of the areas that we are also trying to provide uh, assistance with, is with basically sets of clear questions around um, how have you gone through the, your process, um, how have you done assessments around the performance, and critically, which I think connects again to what Nikita was talking about also, what mechanisms do you have in place for when the system fails? All systems at some point are going to fail. Um, and so you need to have some kind of fail safe mechanism in place. Uh, have you thought this through uh, and, and how have those been tested? And so I'll leave it at that for now. Um, great, thank you for that. That was really great. Um, I think that there's a lot of things in there which probably chimed with what you're doing, Nikita, and the open ethics uh, side of things and making it kind of exposing stuff exposing things to the world. So I don't know if you had a comment on that. I have rather a question to to understand from Ansgar's uh, experience in, in working with uh, other companies uh, and building standards. What, what do you think about those systems and how standards of uh, reducing bias and uh, improving fairness uh, relate to systems that use open data for their uh, for their training data sets. So in in this case, we have a very limited understanding of what kind of bias bias flows in uh, the training data set and who act we, we have very limited information about who actually labeled uh, the data in those data sets. So how do you how do you tend to approach it and have you have you reflected on this question? Um, I think it's an, an important element, the, the understanding the data sets that you're actually using. Uh, and this is, uh, I mean, there's difficulties with properly understanding that even if the data set is more or less built in-house or just its historical data from the organization itself, because often um, metadata around the way in which that was in initially collected uh, is, is lacking. Um, the standards that we have been working on typically do not actually go into that kind of level of detail that they say, um, you know, this is the kind of source of data that you should be using. It, they tend to focus on identifying these are issues that you need to be assessing and you need to document what kind of an assessment you've done. Um, it says, in a, on the one hand, this is a a kind of weakness of standards that comes from uh, wanting to be quite broad in the, the areas where they can be used. Um, on the other hand, it is also a, a deliberate thing in order to make them uh, flexible for future developments in this kind of space. And really, uh, in a sense, the onus for making uh, an assessment whether this standards provide sufficient trustworthiness sort of falls then down to uh, any kind of organization that's going to be certification against that standard. So they might say, okay, the standard has been used, but given that the methodologies that have been used in order to implement it were of this type, 
uh, we basically approve this system to be used only for this very limited kind of context. Um, so I would say probably I'm not giving a very useful, ah, this is how we're going to solve the problems that you are indicating, uh, but more of a, yes, this is an issue and it needs further work. Uh, there are obviously other standards that are being developed that are really focusing more on the data kind of side, both in sort of the big data community and in the A AI one, which I personally am not uh, involved with. So perhaps there might be something more useful in, in those. Great. Um, so has anyone got any more um, comments? And also we have a question just about whether you have published some of this work that we're around um, bias and mitigating those issues. Uh, so on that, the uh, working group, because the, the, the standard is not yet complete, we're hoping to complete it, um, well, bring it to ballot. So basically having it complete and then getting it voted on by the um, technical community uh, in, in April. Um, because the standard hasn't been completed yet, it is not public. However, we have done a couple of sort of short uh, papers to discuss what it is that we are doing in the standard and I will put into the chat uh, a link to where you can find more of the information around our activities regarding the standard. Super, thank you very much. Um, Idoa, have you got a presentation ready? Are you set? Are you primed? Can you hear me? Okay, yes, I, I'm going to, to share some slides, okay? Right. Can you see the presentation? Yes? Okay, great. Okay, so um, for me, it's very good to stay here talking about one thing which, which I consider is like very important when talking about the artificial intelligence systems. But um, I would like to, um, to talk about some things so to let you think a little bit about, about a, a very interesting question, which is, uh, should we think about um, ethics of artificial intelligence or should we still be thinking about ethics of humans when talking with artificial intelligence? Let me go back a little bit to the, even the industrial revolution at that time, we made many inventions, um, which was which which were very very important for humanity. We were making these inventions to improve ourselves, to make us live better. At that time, nowadays we are uh, inventing some things, uh, just like this one, Sophia. I'm sure all of you have have seen this, Sophia, which is a robot where, with artificial intelligence that make and and also is like kind of um, uh, has a peculiar things, uh, which is as very similar to humans. And the question is, why are we making machines similar to humans? Back to the Industrial Revolution, back to the previous inventions that we have uh, we can have invent during the whole history. We really try to, to make these things in order to improve ourselves. Nowadays, with these artificial intelligence systems, we are trying to um, use them inside of robots and we are trying to make these robots similar to humans. And there is also some interesting things. We are also doing some things with these robots, like in, in this image that you can see in which, in which you see uh, Sophia interacting with this, the, the actor Will Smith, like hanging around with him. And then we see, uh, you can see another picture of the, the um, hologram Hatsune Miku doing a concert in Spain that like he has done like many concerts all around the world doing similar things to humans. That is another very, very interesting thing. Even you can see how many, there are many people in, in Japan that has married to, to this hologram, to this, which is a, also an artificial intelligence systems. And it's like very good for these people because, uh, I mean, they, they just come to their, they, they, sometimes they, they ask to these people, why you marry just an AI system to a hologram? And they say, okay, these people, these, this hologram do not 
tell me anything bad when I get home and he's always interested, uh, uh, she's always interested about my 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 things and my my if I marry with a normal wife, she won't. So, um, so uh, keeping going with that thing, we are still thinking about uh, these, these machines beating humans, for example, in the AlphaGo or in uh, Watson, uh, doing a, some context in where we are trying to beat these machines all the time, trying to uh, compete with, with these machines. It is, that is one very interesting thing that we haven't done with other machines and other inventions that we had before. Why now with these artificial intelligence systems are we doing that? We are putting these peculiarities of humans inside of an inside of a machine, in, inside of an invention for that. We are also in, in, in many in, in the mind of many, many people, they have they have in mind that maybe these uh, machines will be uh, take their jobs, or they are also talking a lot about human human the robots rights even more these last times than even human rights, which is very interesting also. So let's think a little bit about why we are uh, talking so much about this artifact this specific. Um, um, uh, we are why we are trying to compete to machines. We are why we are like thinking about uh, these artificial intelligence systems uh, uh, even taking over humanity. There are several elements. One of them is the producers associated with science fiction, science fictions. With the with the previous inventions, we didn't have in in our minds anything that were was related to uh, anything that we have seen previously, and we have it with this artificial intelligence. We already have seen in many movies and many science fiction novels that we have uh, read some um, some uh, robots and some a even AI system, intelligence systems. And that make us think uh, um, this way. Also, we have the decision making, which is a peculiarity just associated until now with the humans. And now we are talking about machines doing this decision making. And there are many people that feels a little bit uh, confused about this uh, staying uh, in, a, in a specific machine. Talking about this, we, we already, I really believe in the, in the um, which is a, a very important thing when talking about ethics of artificial intelligence and, and all of these producers about artificial intelligence, um, which is the culture of one specific place. For example, in the occidental, in the occidental world, we have been grown with um, many movies, which like, for example, Terminator or iRobot or this kind of X machine, machina, in which uh, we see these robots um, in like uh, from very apocalyptic point of view. Uh, while in the and and we see these robots taking over humanity or substituting robots. While in the in the Oriental world, we have seen these people have been growing grown with. Um, some robots like acting as heroes. That is why really over there, there are many people that really believe and they trust more in these technologies than us. And in this in this world, and apart from other elements, but really believe much more in technology. And, and for them, it's easier to interact with, with this technology. OK, let's talk. We have been talking about the producers of science fiction. Let's talk now about the decision making, which is the other uh, key elements. I, I had another picture that also uh, Nikita had because I, I think it's like very relevant. This is like uh, the humans making decisions at this time. This is the trolley problem, which, which all of you, I'm sure, you know, so I won't be repeating this. Uh, so now we have, I, I don't know, if you know, this, uh, this um, example, which is the moral machine of the MIT. And it's the same, like putting the trolley problem into the into a, an autonomous uh, car and make a lot of people around the world uh, try to um, uh, get into this page and try to decide if they would if they would uh, keep going and if an auto, if it's an autonomous car or turn and try to educate machine to create uh, some data in order to 
put all this data in an autonomous car. What is the was one some of the the final reports of this uh, example was that um, at the end some of the conclusions of this example was that at the end there is no like a, a global moral or a global ethics when talking about some uh, very drastic situation of, of very uh, yeah yeah the very drastic situation like this one. So um, it is very important to uh, personalize a little bit more this and talk, or, of, of course, about the culture of each people or, or the place in which any artificial intelligence uh, system is implemented. Um, so, um, so this is the question again. Should we know, sh should we think about ethics for machines or should we still think about ethics for humans, let's try to learn this concept a little bit. So it is a fact that we okay. It's not the same. It is very important to personalize to personalize each, each case. So we can we can use uh, it's, a, it's a fact that we can use artificial intelligence systems to automat to aut automatize uh, uh, process and that do not have any implications. And for that, it is okay. We don't have to be thinking about so many uh, ethics and so many different things, but those, uh, if you try to do it in, in complex process that will imply uh, uh, any any social or professional implications, yeah, we do uh, have uh, to have these 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 thoughts. And um, okay, there is a fact that we have to learn to live together with these, and for that we have like as as I said before, like made like so many international ethical codes in AI, but at the end. As I said before, we we have been uh, we, we 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 there is no one we we wouldn't be able to create just one uh, big code of ethics or artificial intelligence. Just why why? Because as I said before, it's very important to to um, personalize to go to the to the place to the specific country or the specific culture in which this system is being implemented because it's not the same the ethics in Spain for example of the ethics the ethics in France for some things or the ethics in in another in in China for example anyway in, in the European Union I'm sure that all of you know the white paper on the European Commission or artificial intelligence they also have thought about personalizing a, a, um, a little bit more and not personalizing but really um, uh, try to, um, um, uh, for uh, for example, distinguish between high risk applications of artificial intelligence, like in sectors as we were uh, saying before, health, transport, public administration, legal, and and high risk use case or a case of use in order to put regulations in this and leave apart these low risk risk applications. Again, it is not a matter of regulate regulating the whole artificial intelligence technology, but personalize a little bit more and go to the cases of use, specific cases of use, and specifically to each one of the sectors in order to make a specific uh, um, code of ethics or, yeah, a code of ethics for a specific cases of use in each one of these sectors, with which it is, it is the key I consider in order to succeed in the implementation of this technology, and and okay, a, a legislation is needed is needed of course, but there is a little bit more that we need to consider from the civil side. We really have already talked about the multicultural differences, which that is that is very important, but there is another very important thing. Okay, it is a it is a fact also that there there are different perceptions of some very important things nowadays, like privacy. I give classes in the university, for example, and for some people of my class of 20 years old, uh, 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 young people, they're, they're, they have one concept of privacy and the other half of the class, they have another uh, really different concept of privacy. For them, it's like something important for the rest of the people, it's not that important. So. We have to take into account also these perceptions. So I already have talked about with Nikita about this, which I consider that is also the key. I think it's also a responsibility of the consumer, and we should leave, leave we should okay regulate, but also leave the consumer 
some responsibility in order for them to decide if they should consume a specific uh, AI systems, okay, or 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 not, or or not. I consider that that is very important. Okay, and another very important thing is to make um, uh, in order to improve their uh, their their critical mind. It is. It's very important to um, make them uh, uh, many divulgative actions. It is very important to make a lot of active policies from governments towards this need. It is very important to educate society. And from the business side, and I finish with that, it is very important to keep ethics from design, which is very important, which is uh, also a key. And also, uh, like, do some things like this, the BBC box that and in, in which is the the person the uh, which is responsible of this data and i finish with this because i don't have much more time please it is very important this the education of society in order for them to understand to keep aside all their producers to understand that they it is time to to uh, for them to make them themselves responsible also, also for consuming these 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 AI systems also, it is important that the, the public policies towards this, but it's a time also to make people be more responsible, to know more uh, about uh, what they are consuming. And and and, um, and another thing, just for, for the community, this is the last sentence, not because we can do it, we must do it. There is a very important thing. Nowadays we have in our hand, like a, a technology with a lot of power, and it's time to decide if we should uh, not, not not to keep with all the power of this technology sometimes, but just uh, stop and think first about this. It's good to to um, to um, apply this technology or to to give this technology to society, or we should 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 stop a little bit and go to another way. Okay, I'm going to stop here. It's almost I'm almost done. Just to tell you that the time is now, and it's it's very good that we are talking about this because if we don't talk about this now, maybe we will be uh, uh, very bad. If we we will be we will be in trouble later. So thank you very much. Awesome. Uh, thank you very much, Sarah. Um, in the uh, consideration of time, I think if we can, we could go straight into Karosh, if that's okay, and then we can take uh, some of those questions at the end. I've just put up um, the picture of the poll. If you go to Slido, there's a poll going at the moment, which is to do with how much you trust. So um, take a look at that. Okay. Um, let me share my screen. Okay. So can you see my screen? Yeah, that's great. So uh, I'm going to specifically talk, talk about our project that called SafeML. The project is about a human in the loop approach for safety monitoring of machine learning classifiers that we use uh, kind of, let's say, a statistical distance measures. And uh, I should say that we did this, uh, let's say, project as we were from the background of safety and reliability and dependability science. So if we consider the AI applications for uh, safety critical systems like self-driving cars or, for example, uh, very critical medical uh, applications, we should talk about uh, safety issues. And when we want to talk about safety issues, we can categorize them in five categories. For example, how we can do the safe exploration. We may have the scalable oversight. We may want to avoid reward hacking and wireheading. We may, we may, my, and we may go for avoiding the negative side effects and we may focus on robustness to distribution ship. And the SafeML project will focus on robustness to distribution ship. But the overall goal of this project was to somehow estimate the accuracy through statistical distance measures and provide a human in the loop safety monitoring through a specific procedure that I'm going to explain later. And uh, finally, the providing an explainable artificial intelligence 
by providing some uh, statistical measures and uh, try to explain the decisions of the system, of the AI system. So if we want to explain the procedure, we may consider the uh, AI application and divide it into two main parts. One part is the train, uh, training phase, when we train, for example, a specific classifier for a specific task. And the other part would be the application phase, when we uh, run the system, for example, run the classifier on self-driving car, let's say. So uh, when we try to uh, train the, let's say, our uh, machine learning algorithm, we usually have the trusted data set or we try to have the trusted data set at least. And then we try our classifier and we evaluate it. For example, we gain 97% accuracy. But is it good to go if we have the machine learning with 97, 97% for example, accuracy? I would say no. And what we propose is that we, at the training phase, let's say, or offline phase, we Usually, we can evaluate some uh, statistical parameter of the, uh, let's say, training data set, like, for example, cumulated distribution functions like mean values or many, many other statistical uh, parameters. And we can go in the, uh, let's say, uh, application phase, and we can buffer some data. If we have enough data, we uh, load the data into train classifier and we evaluate, for example, the results. But based on the result, we can extract the same, let's say, a statistical parameter and compare the differences. And based on the differences and the expected confidence that we would like to have in such a system, we can have the, uh, let's say, decision. If, for example, we have uh, low confidence, a bit low, lower than threshold, we may ask the system to collect more data. But when we have the huge difference with the expected confidence, we may ask the human agent or use alternative system in the in this regard. So when we have the human in the loop system uh, uh, in the procedure, there are some challenges. For example, how we are going to explain the decisions to the human to make a right decision in that regard. And uh, finally, if we have, for example, the uh, we satisfy the expectation or expected confidence, we usually trust the data set and we go for the we really accept the decision of machine learning algorithm. But here is also important to provide the explainability and report the uncertainties and confidence level of the outputs. But if we want to have the example of this system, consider the security application of, for example, machine learning algorithm. In a simple security application, we might have a hacker and we might have a normal user. Both of them want to have the access to the server through, for example, a specific route. And usually in the network, for example, we might have the network monitoring that can, for example, read the IP, the location, and so on, many other parameters. And a simple, let's say, uh, intrusion detection algorithm can be a classifier, machine learning classifier that can, for example, detect the normal user from the hacker and, for example, filter it from the network if it is, a, for example, hacker or uh, ban the access. But what we... Uh, Additionally, add to this procedure is that if we can provide a certified database, so we can use this procedure that I explained. And if, for example, I have low confidence, we may ask uh, or we may call a human agent to investigate this situation if we have enough time. And if, for example, we have low confidence, we may ask the system or then, for example, here, network monitoring to provide more, more, de more data or record more data from the system. Usually, for example, in this situation, you see some websites uh, show you that claim that I'm not a robot, for example, something like that. And if we have the high confidence, usually we accept the decision and we 
for example, let these uh, security attack detector filter or, for example, access the user to the server. And here is a very simple example that we have. For, for example, for intrusion detection evaluation data set that we evaluate, for example, different uh, statistical measures like Chernoff, like Kolmogorov, Smirnov, and so on. And we measure the accuracy versus the distances that we can get from these statistical distances. And we also, what we did was we, uh, we do this for uh, 100 permutation. And we see, for example, for some specific, uh, let's say, algorithm, there are some variations in uh, between, for example, having the distance and related to the mean accuracy. But for some, uh, let's say, other algorithm, we may have low variation that is acceptable for our system. And if we consider the correlation between those existing statistical measures, we might see that, for example, Wasserstein algorithm has high uh, correlation with uh, Waters, Wasserstein uh, Adderson Dali. And they are, for example, different, they have different, let's say, correlation between class number in this security data set. So, for example, in this security data set, we see that class number changes has, uh, let's say, more correlation with these Wasserstein Anderson Darling algorithm. But uh, let's talk about the other applications that we can consider in this situation. For example, consider the safe uh, autonomous vehicle or self-driving car. In the application of traffic sign, uh, let's say the cognition, we might have a clear traffic sign and we might have, for example, unknown or a uh, very high noise uh, traffic sign that we cannot, for, even the human cannot, for example, understand what is the traffic sign. So in this uh, example, the system want to detect the traffic sign and based on that, for example, do the required action, for example, brake or speed of the system based on, for example, control unit of the car. But uh, again, if we have these uh, certified the, the database of the traffic system and we can, for example, provide those confidences, so we might ask the driver to do the manual driving. If, if the system, for example, the decision can be uh, do in, for example, in a certain amount of time, if we don't have limit time, let's say. And we can also, for example, do the other things uh, like, for example, requesting more data from the system or communi 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 communicating with uh, nearby cars. And if the, there is a high confidence, we can accept the decision and go on. Again, another example can be in medical science when, for example, we have a chest scan, for example, COVID-19, let's say, and we have uh, one unknown, let's say, or uh, common disease symptoms and sometimes we have rare disease symptoms and here we need to have some again human in the loop procedure to for example when we have low confidence we should ask for example a medical doctor to do the for example uh, manual diagnosis let's say and if we have low confidence we might ask for example for more data or more images and if we have high confidence, we might accept the decision and say, OK, we can automatically uh, create the report, diagnosis report, or we can automatically prescribe a needed drugs, uh, for example, drugs. And regarding the reproductive uh, ability of the system, we provide these uh, safe ML functions in the GitHub in three languages in MATLAB, in Python, and in R with different, let's say, number of examples that you can check and uh, see how it works. That's it. Thank you. Well, thank you, everyone. We really need, um, like, some clap noise, right? Yes. <laughs> um, so thank you to all our speakers. Um, I'm just going to share my screen so that you can see some of the polls that we have going here. Um, so. Can you see the poll coming up now? Hopefully. Ooh. Yep. Um, so it's 
a spread of people. Um, it's, uh, I'm not going to have to run any statistics on it quite yet, but we've got 14 uh, contributions and we've kind of got this kind of bell curve situation going on a bit. Um, not quite. So people are all over the place with whether they trust uh, in life critical decisions, uh, which is interesting. Uh, we've got people from all over the place um, joining in today. So hello to you. Uh, and we've got lots of questions. Um, some of them I uh, prioritise over the others because because this is a series, we'll, we'll come back to some of these questions in future. Um, so today, because we're prioritising in the loop, um, can I ask the panel whose responsibility it is to control or administrate um, you know, the human in the loop function? And we talked about this a little bit, but can you specify kind of whose responsibility that sort of um, effort is? Um, so maybe I'll kick off um, on some answers and I'm sure the others will improve on my answer. Um, so I'll start with the well it depends because it depends on the context that you're uh, talking about which kind of system it is. Um, however, for many applications the responsibility lies with whoever has basically built the system is or is deploying the system. They are the ones who understand what the system is supposed to be doing. Uh, hopefully will have done some assessment as to what kind of impacts it can have and therefore will be in a good position to assess um, the importance of human in the loop in that kind of a process. It would be very difficult for a general, let's say, uh, regulator around AI to make a strong um, strong statement on this because uh, they wouldn't know the specifics of this particular kind of application. But I'm happy to hear other views on this, and maybe discuss this and change my mind on it. Yeah, I, I can give my five cents on this um, in the project, uh, uh, one of the projects of the European Commission where I'm involved as a stakeholder uh, called Sherpa, we're working on two types of guidelines where one is the guideline for deployment and another one is a guideline, guideline for development. And in both of those guidelines, we're talking about product owner or a process owner where product owner is pretty clear who it is, is, a, is, is the person who is responsible for building the, the, uh, building the product and evaluating market need, understanding who is going to be consumer. So he, this person is typically have a very good understanding of who the, who the end user is going to be. And a part of that, the, the, the uh, measures taken uh, while developing the product where when we talk about the deployment, we talk about the process owner. So the person who has found the vendor and evaluated the vendor as being safe or as being as a one who fits a particular uh, particular criteria. But uh, what we what we do uh, all agree on is that it is a, uh, it is a person or a company that brings this forward that that brings this accessible to the to the end user. Great, um, super. So we'll, we'll move on to something else. Um, I, I was just wondering if um, what you were displaying, Karosh, was something that people can pick up today. I know you had um, all your code and things like that on GitHub and places like that. And uh, just a note for myself, it seems like your answer is more machine learning on top of machine learning, essentially, and less human inside that loop. Um, or I guess, could you explain how, how the human works? Actually, you are right. Uh, actually, it's somehow statistics above the machine learning somehow. And I should say that we didn't, let's say, focus uh, too much on these, uh, let's say, human perception of the system and human in the loop. We just, uh, let's say, propose that human should be part of the system and part of the loop. But 
further uh, research works needed to, let's say, justify this kind of questions that how we are going to, for example, uh, collaborate with the human in this kind of situations, let's say. Gorosh, did I, did I understand correctly that in your research, you're particularly targeting not exactly how the human in the loop should be involved, but when? Uh, correct me if I understand it wrong, is that what you're proposing is that there is a specific um, way where you can estimate the confidence in the result of the prediction uh, of, of the output of the machine. And therefore, what you're proposing is to have human in the loop engaged to human put in the loop once we are not confident about the output enough so not after the output is happening but actually before the output is happening when the when we when the predicted confidence is low is it is it the correct way of understanding or not really uh, yes yes exactly we just uh, let's say put the human in the loop when we have low confidence of the system and when we have the confidence we just provide the report for the human as a, for example, explainability and trustworthy factor, nothing more. Great, so we have another question. Um, in the human loop debate, are we starting to now evaluate the ethics of the developer as, the, as well as the system? So we have people who are designing, building, we might have people who are helping with the de deployment and sitting on top of the loop or sitting in the loop somewhere. Um, are we evaluating these people's ethics and um, do we do we care about that? Do we have to, to legally lock down things so that they don't have a chance to have any kind of moral agency and they know exactly what to do? How does all that work? Um, any thoughts? Yeah, I really, I really think so. I really believe in in that this time to evaluate the ethics, but not only of the, the ethics of the developer, but the ethics of, for example, the owner of the company and the people that are making decisions in a company, because in some companies, the developer is just a, another worker and it's, um, and it's the decisions of the, like the um, high level uh, heads of that one specific company that tell that developer what to do what systems to develop or what is uh, the, the ones that have to be conscious about the about the necessity of thinking about ethics when developing these artificial intelligence systems. So it is not a matter of just, uh, it's not time to uh, make uh, developers uh, think, think ethically, but also to, it's time to make People like uh, people in the in the heads of this company to be conscious of the necessity of think of put the human in the loop to uh, make uh, transparent and and uh, liable uh, alg algorithms and all of this stuff. And many there are many people that are not many people in the heads of these big companies that are very traditional that do not they they just think about this technology of another one, just another uh, typical new technology. And this is not the same as other technologies that we have previously. And it's time to, you know, to make the, them conscious about the differences between other technologies and these artificial intelligence systems. Um, great, so we should um, forget about our shareholders and we should get some morals and we should um, educate these people um, that you know that's that's what I'm hearing is that is that you know going too far maybe or is that is that like practical is that something that actually you know some some of you were talking about legislation is that where legislation comes in and it helps us out yeah so first of all um, I definitely agree with uh, pretty much everything that uh, Idoya uh, just said around this kind of question it definitely the the question about the ethical development and use of these systems lies not just with the developers, but with the people who have control over the way in which the organization is running. Doing the, uh, a good um, ethics process requires resources. Those resources need to be made available uh, to the teams who are doing this work. If, if management isn't willing to make those available, then it's impossible to do a good job of this and you end up with something like 
might basically be ethics washing. You um, just attempted something but not done it properly. Uh, there are a number of motivating factors that can push uh, an organization to actually engage with this process. One of them is just the reputational harm that can come out of deploying a system and uh, it failing in, in a very public kind of way. Um, another is trying to anticipate where is the public mood going. I mean, we've seen this, for instance, with the uh, IBM, Microsoft, and others putting out of the face recognition um, uh, market to a large extent uh, as a result of the backlash that has come and the resulting legislative action that has also happened in various states in the US. Uh, and so this has been basically uh, quite a bit of money that went into developments that they are now not going to move forward with. Um, the role and importance of regulatory action in this space cannot be underestimated. So um, EY also did a survey together with Future of Society um, Institute around how business leaders are looking at AI principles and where their priorities are in these and compared to that with the priorities that policymakers are having and saw somewhat of a, a, a difference in where priorities lie. And the, the easiest way of summarizing where was business leaders as priorities was basically in maintaining compliance with existing regulation. Uh, and so the way in which regulation is formulated will always largely um, set where are the priorities for resource allocation in, in firms. Nikita? Yeah, I just wanted to 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 add to the question that was raised by uh, Idoya also that the developers should should have responsibility. Uh, there is a, 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 there is a technical difficulty in in making this possible, but I wanted to mention the the one of the approaches that we are. Uh, developing an open ethics called open ethics data passport where we do not sp specifically focus on developers but rather on evaluation of the ethics of um, of those or worldviews of those who label the data sets that allows uh, creation of the profiles for those people who, who label the data set uh, that can convey information both about their uh, their experience in labeling specific data sets, but also in how their worldviews can can impact the uh, can impact the output of the system. Because if there are three or four people who are doing the active data labeling, and one person is doing half of the data set, and another person is doing just a ten percent of the data set, probably the worldviews of the one who, who who is doing more data points in the data set will be prevalent. So uh, it's not it's not the approach that is giving a solution to this to to the overall problem of of bias or responsibility, but it gives the technical way to come back and investigate of what actually has gone wrong and where can we implement the safety measures uh, afterwards based on the type of uh, the data and data passport that um, that the system has. So that's uh, that's one comment. Yeah, thank you. And, and you can check out more information on the website about that. Um, so um, I was wondering, um, is there any fields or areas that we just should step away from? We should just go, OK, well, actually, you know, maybe even if we had human in the loop uh, processes, they're still not going to be good enough. We still don't want this technology actually um, in this um, area those sorts of things. Um, we could talk about legal things, maybe, deciding if we go to prison, which is uh, a good example. But are there other things that maybe we should just never touch with machine learning techniques, AI techniques? Um, anyone um, interested? Yeah, so maybe um, I'll start off on, on this one again. Uh, so yes, I would say um, there are likely to be areas where we would say um, basically we should not be using systems that are based on machine learning. Um, the exact ones, I I'm, I won't try to try you know pin them down, but 
Uh, one definite area where I think we should be very cautious about trying to use machine learning is things like um, the in, in the legal system. Um, but generally speaking, it's things where we are we have decided as a society that the assessment should be done really at an individual basis um, based on how you, for instance, in the criminal justice system, how has this particular individual behaved in the case? Has this individual shown criminal intent, etc.? Those kinds of questions, as opposed to, is this individual somebody who seems to fall into the class of people like this, who statistically tend to be criminals and those kinds of things, because fundamentally, the way in which our machine learning op uh, systems operate is statistics. They are looking for patterns of similarity, ca categorizing a person into a category of people who statistically tend to operate in a way and are there and are making a, um, a prediction based on this. And this is fundamentally different to what we have said of how the legal system is supposed to operate. And, and a similar thing was basically at, at the core of the um, of the problems with the uh, grading or, or the, the A-levels assessment algorithm that was used uh, earlier this year, in that fundamentally what the algorithm, and it wasn't really machine learning, but what the algorithm was doing was to do statistics. It said, well, statistically, this school has these kinds of um, grades. And so statistically speaking, um, all of the people in, in this year's uh, class should be falling in these kinds of grades. And so people were not, the, the children were not being evaluated individually as to how are you performing, but rather within this cohort, you are at this kind of location and statistically in your school, that means you're going to have this kind of a grade, which is fundamentally different from what we've said that the, the, the assessment system should be based on. Uh, extremely problematic, that one, <laughs> um, I would say, personally. Um, do, do anyone else have any more comments on that? Um, anything stick out for you? Um, if, if not, then we can go to kind of the other things that might help, you know, so what other things do um, human in the loop kind of processes or ideas help with? Um, so there's a, there's a question around whether they can actually help machine learning as we have it today and um, where there maybe isn't human in the loop um, happening uh, and where we can bring those processes in uh, and make uh, better situations for maybe um, healthcare or, you know, just dealing with any system that needs to kind of perform better, maybe. I was kind of hoping for Nikita or Karosh to come in on this one. Yeah, yeah I, I'd jump in. Um, I think the important, the, the, there are two, two parts of this human in the loop. One is in the loop and another is human. So as soon as we're able to evaluate the quality of our uh, the quality of our outputs and, and and get some idea about whether we we do have a false positive decision taking or 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 a false negative decision taking we should uh, we should bring this feedback to the, to the system so it's a, it's a feedback loop that essentially plays a role um, what i want to uh, underline here is that in this question, we're taking a particularly backward uh, point of view. So we are looking at the very specific decision that is already taken. And we take this decision, we retrace it back, we look at how the system maps the input and the output, and we then supply this uh, to either a development team or if our algorithm has an online training we we give it back we give it back directly to improve the algorithm but i think it it's it, what is uh crucial to understand is whether we're looking at the system as a system that will deliver and we expect to to have some some kind of decision from the system or the decision is already taken so we're we're looking at this from the other side um, I, I think this this is an essential uh, an essential element at, uh, looking at the human and the loop uh, configurations. 
Uh, great. So, um, Eudoria, um, you mentioned that you think that people should be uh, educated, brought up. Um, how much um, do we all need to be data scientists or indeed ethicists? Okay. Yeah, I, I really I really think there are many people that are, yeah, we are we are all talking about um, that data scientists and all experts like in a very high level. Uh, but we 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 don't have to forget that all this society, the regular society, would be the ones that will be receiving all these artificial intelligence system and using this artificial intelligence system at the end, the advantages and disadvantages. And there are many people in the in the regular society that do not know how to distinguish a robot from an artificial intelligence system. You know, and sometimes we forget about that at some level, but we have to think about that. And the first thing that we have to do in order for this artificial intelligence system to evolve, to really get uh, that we have like society demanding these products with artificial intelligence system without being afraid of of them, what the first thing that we have to do is to start um, educating this society and showing them that what is really an AI system, what are the real advantages of these AI systems in the really in the different services that they will be consuming, consuming or the different products that, that they will be consuming, consuming, and um, from their primary school, they should be I uh, know that our kids have to know how to use their data, how it's going to be used their data. And how to uh, how to interact with the machines, knowing that they have the like the final decisions of the different things that they don't have to be to be manipulated, and it's not a matter of being manipulated by machines and all these kind of things, and you know, and to get enough criteria in order to decide by themselves and just uh, let these machines to help them them in their in their decisions. Okay, and um, there, there, I think this that is very important in order to to so society get all the advantages of everything that we are talking here now, and you know, leave aside all these disadvantages or get get aside all the producers and all these things about data about these AI systems and all that they are just as science fiction things, and you know, get aware of the real things and be conscious of the things that they should be worried about. So it's, as I'm telling you, I think it's a matter of they, they should be educated since they are ver very young in this kind of things. Yes. Mm -hmm. Awesome. So uh, we've run over quite a bit. Um, so thank you very much to all the panelists. Um, I'm going to invite you each individually to say one thing before we leave. Um, one thing to leave the, um, the people who are still here, still watching. Uh, so thank you to those uh, people who um, have dropped off, but people who are still here. Um, if you could go around, uh, Koresh, do you have something that you can say? Uh, we'll go uh, around on my screen. This is Koresh, Hidoya, uh, 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 Nikki, and then Ansgar, and then we'll finish. Okay. Okay. Uh, my, my sentence is, not because we can do it, we should do it. I think that is, and we always should have the human in the loop. And another thing, please um, remember regular society. Re remember to educate society and these things. So these are my two sentences. Don't forget consumers. Also, don't forget uh, consumers. And remember that not because we can do it, we should do it. Uh -huh. OK. First of all, thanks for all, uh, let's say, participants of this event. And I should say that we should not only think that AI can solve the our problems, but also think about their safety, the responsibility, the, let's say, explainability, and how we can, for example, at this level, put these human in the loop for the, let's say, having the better and responsible, let's say, AI system for ourselves. Thank you. Yeah, I would uh, I would say from my side that I am a big believer in the consumer and that consumers do have brains and ability to decide whether they want or they don't want something. So it's in our force and responsibility to bring 
an instrument for uh, for our fellow citizens to make these informed decisions, because uh, today there is a very high asymmetry in in between what consumers know about how systems function and what uh, producers or product owners know. So I think I think we can change it uh, gradually with education. Uh, and as final thoughts, I would like to say, well, first of all, thank you for a very great uh, discussion, but also um, no matter the kind of hype around AI and machine learning, uh, these are still tools and they are built and used and operated uh, by humans in human organizations, in human societies. So responsibility and accountability will always lie with humans um, and don't let the machine uh, blur that line. Um, ultimately, the responsibility lies at humans. And so uh, really ask, who is it that holds this um, accountability? Amazing. So thank you very much again to our panelists. Thanks for joining us. Um, that's it. We're going to have another um, one in the 17th of December. So come back and check that out. Uh, if you want to get involved, again, um, use the hashtag and um, find all the slides on Discord. Uh, get hold of us on LinkedIn or Twitter, wherever you like to um, stalk digitally people. Um, and then we'll um, hopefully see you in the kind of more trustworthy, responsible um, AI mediated future. So I'll see you then.